Hi, fifth graders. I wanted to share a book that I really enjoy um, that I think will go great with your study of um, colonization and um, people coming to America to be settlers here. Um, this is a book called Roanoke, The Lost Colony, and it's a history mystery. Um, it is written by Jane Yolen and Heidi Elizabeth Yolen Stimple. Um, and illustrated by Roger Roth. And here's what I love. I'm gonna kind of put this in pieces because it really shines a light on the mystery of what happened to the people who first came here from the Roanoke and, and were in the Roanoke colony and what could have happened to them. So I would love to hear at the end what you guys think your um, decision on the mystery and what really happened to this first colony here in what is now the United States. All right, so I'm gonna share a little bit with you and then um, I hope that you guys will share with me your um, solutions of what you think happened, okay? Roanoke, the Lost Colony. An unsolved mystery from history. When I grow up, I want to be a detective, just like my dad. He says I was born curious and curiosity is the best tool a detective can have. Right now, I'm curious about old mysteries that have never been solved. In police terms, these cases are called open, but Dad and I call them unsolved mysteries from history. And I am determined to figure out at least one of them. For each mystery, I collect as much about the case as I can. As I go along, I organize the clues in my notebook. Sometimes I use timelines, and I always keep a list of words that are important to the case. Roanoke, the Lost Colony, is about a group of English people who came to the American continent in the 1500s to begin a new settlement. They all disappeared. Though lots of people have ideas, or theories, about what might have happened, no one is sure. My dad says no mystery is impossible to solve as long as you have enough clues. This is how the story goes. Okay, here's the girl who's narrating the story. The mystery, the detective, the history detective. All right, and you know how much you guys work in fifth grade on um, citing evidence from the text and using clues to make decisions about things. So I really want you to listen to what you think happened here in Roanoke. In the year 1587, England and Spain were at war. A major battleground was the New World. Along the East Coast, forts were scattered, the one at Roanoke manned by English soldiers. An early colony of 108 men complaining about the harsh conditions and lack of supplies had returned home. They had been poorly prepared for life in the New World and had depended upon the native people for food while treating them badly. There had been frequent fights and the colonists had accidentally infected the native people with European diseases. A native chief had been slaughtered. This was not a good way to begin a new settlement. New soldiers had arrived at the abandoned fort to hold it until new colonists could arrive. And colonists were sure to come. The lure of gold and farmland were too strong for any complaints to matter. Here you can see um, the barricades they'd set up. And I will put some of these informational um, pieces that this author leaves for us. She does a mixture of fiction and nonfiction. I'll put those in into this video, okay, so that you can see them. John White was a loyal Englishman and an artist. He was chosen to lead the colony by Sir Walter Raleigh, who had been given the charter to the land in Roanoke by the Queen. White may not have had leadership skills, but he had already been to the New World. He had brought back paintings of the new plants, animals, and people. The colonists were chosen by Raleigh and White to build the new community. There were more than 60 men, farmers, craftsmen, assistants. There were close to 20 women, including White's own pregnant daughter, to work in the fields and houses. There were almost a dozen children. Now, a charter is a royal or government document granting rights. And um, this is going to give us information about John White's journal. I'll put pictures of these in in just a little bit of the nonfiction pieces, okay? Two native men were also part of White's group. 
One of them, Manteo, had traveled in the company of the English before. John White hoped they would help the colonists with the local native people. He knew that the earlier colonists had had problems with fights, with diseases, with killings, although he had never told Raleigh. He was sure that with the soldiers already at the fort and with Manteo to help, he could keep his colonists safe. What do you think? Do you think he can keep them safe? What do we know about the colonists and the Native Americans? The colonists left Portsmouth on April 26, 1587. They planned to meet with the soldiers, then go to Chesapeake Bay, north of Roanoke, where the land was more fertile and the harbor was safer. They sailed in three boats, a flyboat, a pinnace, and the flagship Lion. After a month and a half at sea, they reached the Americas at last, stopping first on several islands. At Santa Cruz, several colonists ate green fruit. Their lips and tongues swelled badly. Oh, wonder what they ate. They must have been allergic to it, huh? A number of people drank from a pond that had water so evil they fell dreadfully ill. Oof, that sounds like bad water. Some who washed their faces in the water had swollen eyes for five or six days after. They captured five huge tortoises for meat. So large, 16 men became exhausted hauling them back to the ship. Can you imagine? Look at the size of these tortoises. And they ate them for meat. That is some new information for me. At last, the flagship dropped anchor outside Roanoke's shallow harbor. White and 40 of his men planned to take the boat to shore to meet with the soldiers, then continue on to Chesapeake, where they were going to stay. But the ship's pilot, Simon Fernandez, had other ideas. He refused to take the colonists any farther and put them all ashore at Roanoke. When White and his men got to the fort ahead of the larger group of colonists, they found it raised. Now, I needed some help with that word, raised. It says right here that raised means destroyed completely by having been torn down. That's new information for me, too. I'm glad I have that new vocabulary word. Great melon vines grew in what remained of the houses. Deer grazed there. All that was left of the soldiers was a single skeleton. Whoa, a single skeleton. How is that possible? We must make the best of what we have, said White. So they began to repair the houses. While work continued on the buildings, one man, George Howe, went fishing alone. Stripping off his clothes, he waded into shallow water, trying to catch crabs with a small forked stick. That reminds me, we just watched the movie Castaway in my house. That's what he tries to do in the movie too, catch crabs. When he did not return, the others searched for him. They found him dead, riddled with arrows. Ooh, that makes me think Native Americans were involved. The colonists suspected Indians had killed him. White sent Manteo and 20 men to Croatoan Island, where the nearest people lived, nearest native people lived, excuse me. They approached the village with drawn muskets, which frightened the peaceful Croatoans until they saw Manteo, who translated their story. Four soldiers were in a boat fishing. Thirty of our enemies from several other tribes surrounded the soldiers at the fort. Men on both sides were killed. The soldiers, who were not hurt, ran to the boat and rowed away. We never saw them again. George Howe was killed by the same people. The Croatoans then pleaded for a token by which the English would know them as friends. No token was given. Now I'm thinking of that word token. I think of like when we go to Dave and Buster's or Boondocks and we get the tokens. I don't think that's what they mean here. Do you think they just mean like an offering? Later that week, the English mounted a surprise attack in the middle of the night on the people they thought had killed Hal. Spying a campfire, they shot one man and chased the others through the reeds, including women and children. Oof, that makes me angry. But the colonists had made a terrible mistake. These were the friendly Croatoans, who, knowing their enemies had left the area, 
had come to gather up peas, corn, pumpkin, and tobacco. So they attacked friendly Native Americans. Hmm. As a reward for faithful service, the English christened Manteo a few days later, calling him Lord of Roanoke and, I don't know how to say this, Dasamunkapok. They thought this would make him a better friend to the English and a loyal subject of Queen Elizabeth. What Manteo thought of the ceremony is unknown. Do you think he cared about being crowned by the English like a noble person? I have a feeling that probably wasn't very important to him. All right, I'm gonna pause there for just a minute and I'm gonna put in some clips of all the pictures with the facts that this author has given us instead of just this kind of um, historical fiction piece of how she's written it, okay? I'll be back. Okay, when we left off, they had just attacked the friendly Crowan and christened, like a baptism, um, the Native American Manteo, who had been helping them. Let's see what happens next. Here we go. Can you see what's happening? There's a new baby. On August 18th, John White's daughter, Eleanor, gave birth to Virginia Dare, the first English child born in America. Hmm. Don't we have a state called Virginia? This was cause for great celebration, but summer was drawing to a close and the colonists started to worry. They were quickly running out of supplies. Now, why do you think they'd be scared at the end of summer when they're running out of supplies? Do you know anything about the East Coast and the weather there when fall and winter come? Could be dangerous. No one knew they were on Roanoke Island. They were supposed to be in Chesapeake, 50 miles to the north. Should they move there? Should they send someone back to England to let Raleigh know of their plight? A plight is a difficult and dangerous situation. White was pressured to go. He hated leaving his daughter and new grandbaby, but the colonists were convinced he was the best man for the job. So he buried his notebooks, drawings, map, and armor, and worked out a special code with the colonists. If you leave, carve your destination on a tree put a cross there if there has been trouble nine days later on august 27th white set sail for england i feel like they're kind of leading us to some important information here about carving it into a tree you want to remember that also try to remember that the boat trip 
from um, Virginia or Roanoke there back to England would have taken months in the 1500s, okay? And there were no phones, no texting to happen to check in. So he leaves on August 27th, goes to England. What do you think is going to happen to the people back in Roanoke? Does this worry you at all? White left Roanoke in a storm, an awful crossing, desperate to get to England, desperate to round up supplies, and desperate re to return quickly to Roanoke Colony. But politics, war, and the Spanish Armada, that's like a Navy fleet, all conspired to keep him in England. There was nothing he could do. Half a year later, in the spring, White tried to sail with two small ships filled with sailors, 15 new colonists, and supplies. But the sailors insisted on privateering along the way. Now, luckily, I have a little glossary here. Privateering means acting legally as a pirate with a letter of commission from the king or queen. Hm. I didn't know there were legal pirates. Okay, so the sailors are privateering on the way. They attacked not only Spanish ships, but a Scottish boat and a French ship as well. White was wounded twice in hand-to-hand -hand combat. All of the colonists' supplies were stolen. They limped back to England. So White tries to get there, has to go back to England. Hmm. Uh-oh. This doesn't look good. It was March 20th, 1590, before Raleigh could gather enough money to send any other ships. Wow, didn't he leave like the August the year before? That's a long time. Five months later, having survived storms and more fights, the ships anchored at the tip of Croatoan Island. Finally, they moved on to the outer islands. Even though it was evening, White and his men could see smoke rising from the vicinity of the Roanoke Fort. Now, is that smoke, do you think, like um, a campfire or like the fort's on fire? In the morning, they tried to row ashore in two small boats through terrible waves. One boat capsized, that means it turned over, several, no, I'm sorry, seven men. Okay, when we left off, the boats had capsized, some had drowned, they were trying to get back to the island. This might be the most famous image from the time. Let's see what happened. Anchoring in the shallow harbor that night, they tried to alert the colonists by sounding a trumpet, by singing English folk songs loudly, by calling out to the people on shore. There was no answer. In the morning, they went to the fort. It was completely empty. Carved into a tree near the village were the letters C-R-O. On one of the palisade posts was the word Croatoan. There was no cross indicating any trouble. Remember we talked about that before when he said to carve something and um, put a cross if there had been trouble? All that they found inside the fort were bars of iron, pigs of lead, iron shot. Um, by the way, that isn't a pig an animal. Luckily, the glossary here says, pigs are oblong masses of a particular kind of metal, in this case, lead. And iron shot are pellets of iron that are shot from a gun. Once buried chests, like treasure chests, lay overturned, ransacked, including White's own possessions. The boat used by the colonists was gone Weeds grew everywhere. Hmm. Sounds like they've been attacked. Escaped? What do you think? John White returned to England. 
Due to storms, politics, money, history, he never set foot in the New World again. Isn't that amazing? But other explorers did. John Smith, friend of Pocahontas, heard from two Indian tribes that clothed men still lived in the area. Later, Pocahontas' father admitted being part of an attack on the colonists. Mm -hmm. Smith did not speak of this until 14 years after returning to England. Another explorer, William Strachey, heard rumors in 1610 of Indians whose slaves built them stone-walled houses. Others heard stories of blonde, blue-eyed natives. Yet no such clothed men, slaves, or blonde natives were ever found. Centuries later, the Lumbee of North Carolina claimed their ancestors were both Indian and English. In 1998, archaeologists discovered an English signet ring on a dig in nearby Hatteras Island. A signet ring is a ring with initials or a family crest engraved on it. Hmm. Kind of reminds me of like a Super Bowl ring or um, a class ring from people who graduate. Could that ring have belonged to one of the lost colonists? No one can really be sure. You can see here is uh, John White, I bet, thinking through everything that happened. Here's how the young girl narrator ends our story. These are the five most popular explanations ever given. Are any of them right? Nobody knows for sure. Not the police, not the lawyers, not the reporters, not the historians, and not even my dad. It is a mystery still waiting to be solved. It is, as my dad says, an open file. But I've got my own theory about what happened to the lost colony of Roanoke. And maybe now, you do too. You can see here she looks like she's working along with her cat, looking at some things. She's got books. Maybe she had to do some remote learning too. Fifth graders, I would love to hear your theory. I'm going to give you links to all the theories. I'll give your teachers links to all the theories. And I would really love it if you went back into the story to find clues of what you think really happened to the lost colony of Roanoke. Thanks for letting me be part of your history lessons. I miss you all, and I hope to see you soon. Bye, guys.